Good. Well, we're glad that you're here with us this morning. Hey, I just want to, like Dennis was saying, take a moment and just talk a second about what happened here a little over 12 hours ago. Uh, some of us, it seems like only a couple hours ago, we were still here cleaning up, but um, it is what it is. Who needs sleep? We had, uh, like Dennis said, we had a little over 300 people here last night, which was beyond our expectations uh, and our desire, especially for the first year of, of doing this block party. And so we are just uh, praising God for that. There were some 30 plus volunteers, and I know some of you were here that didn't necessarily sign up to be a volunteer, and yet you jumped in and helped. And so I just want to say thank you. If you were here last night and helped with the block party, thank you for uh, giving up your Saturday evening uh, and being here and loving on people from our community. I had tons and tons of positive feedback from different people uh, that had ca came and, and just had a blast. We had live music, we had free food, we had dunk tanks. I didn't have to get in the dunk tank, which is, I call that a good night, right? Yeah, not everybody agrees with that, but uh, yeah, and, uh, just tons of fun. And so, um, yeah, we were just excited about what took place last night. And I want to give a special shout out as well to, there's about 11 people who for the last couple months have really been spending a ton of time uh, planning this and contacting businesses for support and getting materials together and everything. And so I just want to give a special shout out to those individuals as well. Um, just thank you. Thank you for making the, the first annual, really, block party a success last night. Um, and so, hey, here's the reality. I don't know if you knew this or not. Yeah. I don't know if you realize this or not, but uh, summer is ending. This is kind of a bummer, right? I don't know if you're like me, but I really like the summer months a lot more than uh, winter. And so the reality is, is though school starts tomorrow, so junior high, high school, and elementary kids are in the corner in the fetal position, wishing that wasn't the case. But, um, you know, the, the reality is, is that we're in a transition time right now with, uh, with summer coming to an end and fall getting on and routines starting back up. Uh, many of you know we homeschool our kids, uh, and, you know, Two of our kids are in elementary work right now. Hannah's doing second and third grade work. Brecken's doing kindergarten work. We've got one in preschool, and then we have one that runs around and makes noises and bugs the others while they're trying to do their schoolwork. And, and, and when I say we homeschool, I mean, if you know anything about us, you know that that's pretty generous for me because we are not doing much homeschooling. My wife does mo most of the homeschooling. I really support her by not being there much and what I mean by that is at all uh, because it wouldn't be productive like she had a doctor's appointment earlier this week and I tried teaching math that was a struggle second grade math is hard apparently um, there you go I'm a 31 year old man can't do second year old math but I, I fulfill the role it seems like of the principal in our house but not the cool principal that sits down and eats lunch with you and not the cool principal that goes out and plays football at pl in the playground or pushes you on the swing. I'm the principal that gets called in when the six-year-old throws his math book at his older sister. Hypothetical, of course. <laughs> but I get, I'm the one that gets called in for that. So we, we started school last year, or not la last year, last week, um, and uh, just tried to begin this kind of consistency and this schedule that was lacking over the summer. And, and many of you probably know or remember from when you had kids that, you know, during summer months, if you take that off, a lot of times it is chaotic and schedules are important to kids. And so we really felt like we needed to get going on school earlier than, than we normally would have. And so we started last week. And, and really it's a time of recalibration. It's a time of refocus. It's a time of, of getting back into the routine. Many of you understand this. And for kids going back to school, whether it was last week or starting tomorrow for our public schools, you know, many Many times, it's, a, it's just a little bit of a, a season of, of getting used to the routine again. You're getting used to sitting at a desk for, you know, a long period of time. You're getting used to the higher expectations. You're, you're just refocusing yourself back on, you know, what is expected and what's needed for, for students to be in school for that amount of time. And, and the reality is, I think, for all of us, whether you're in school or not, the end of August, the beginning of, of September really is a transitional time for us, right? Like, like we're transitioning out of the chaos that is kind of summer and, and we're transitioning out of the, you know, unstructuredness that is summer a lot of times for us and the busyness that is summer. And, and a lot of times for, you know, September kind of marks the beginning of 
Okay, let's get some consistency back in our life. Let's get some focus back in our life. And so this morning, as, as we enter into this transitional period um, in our year right now, I want us as a church just to kind of step back for a moment and look at who we are as a church. And so for this morning, I want us just to refocus and get our eyes set back on what God has called us to do and to be about as a church. And so it breaks down to simply this. And if you've been attending for, you know, more than a couple months, you, you probably heard this. We exist as a church to connect people to Jesus Christ and each other. We exist as a church to connect people to Jesus Christ and, and each other. This is why we exist. This is why we do what we do. This is why we do things like the block parties, is to make connection with people in order to hopefully connect them to Jesus, connect them to their Savior, connect them to the one who can save their soul. And so we exist to connect people to Jesus Christ and each other. And so this morning as we spend some time diving into this together, I, I want us to look at this not from just the aspect of the church, this is what the church is about, but for each one of us personally, what, what are we about ourselves? Are we about ultimately connecting people to Jesus ourselves? Are we about connecting people to other believers as well. And so we're going to start in John chapter 1 this morning. If you have a Bible, go ahead and flip there. It'll be on the screen behind me as well. That's where we're going to begin. Will you pray with me as we begin this morning? God, I'm so thankful for uh, this church, and I'm thankful for uh, these people that uh, gather here together every week to worship you, to um, open your word, to hear from you, to, to follow you together. And I just pray, God, that uh, as we hear your words this morning, that, that you would speak to us, that you would grow us, that you would challenge us and convict us and encourage us, God, that, that you would help us get our eyes set and focused back on you, on what you desire for us to be personally and what you desire for us to be as a church. So God, I thank you and I praise you for what happened last night, and I'm just thankful for the 300 people that were here that um, we were able to just make small connections with have small touches uh, in their lives, and I pray that, first of all, you would be glorified by what take, took place and that you would, uh, you would bring them to yourself in some way. Um, use that as just an opportunity um, for them to see you in their lives. And so, God, we thank you, we praise you, thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that I pray. Amen. So John chapter 1 starts off with Jesus already in the midst of his ministry. He, he's already out, he's, he's begun traveling around, he's begun calling people to follow him, calling his disciples to follow him, and up until this point where we're going to start in, the, in, in verse 47 this morning, up until verse 47, uh, individuals like Peter, James, and, and John, and Andrew have already made a decision to kind of leave what they were doing behind and follow Jesus. And, and so uh, Jesus is out, and he's traveling around, and he's calling people, and one day Jesus and these guys, they leave for Galilee. And they're making their way along the road, and they come, come across a man named Philip. Uh, and Philip uh, sees Jesus, they have this interaction, interaction and, and, and Jesus, his invitation to him was simple. He says to Philip, follow me. And Philip immediately gets up and he follows Jesus. And I don't know if there was more to that or not, but that's what John chapter 1 describes. And so they continue on their way a little bit more, and they encounter another man. And this man's name is Nathaniel. And Philip seems to have a little bit of a connection with Nathaniel. And so Philip runs up to Nathaniel and he says to Nathaniel, Look, we found the man that Moses talked about. Moses from the Old Testament, the prophet, the one who was a leader of God's people in the Old Testament that talked about a future Messiah. And he talked about this Jesus that was coming. Philip goes up to Nathaniel and he says, Hey, we found him. We found the one that, Mos that Moses was talking about. We found Jesus from Nazareth, he tells Nathaniel. But at this point, we get a different response from Nathaniel than we saw from Philip. There was no immediate, yes, I will follow from Nathaniel. There really wa was a little bit more of, of a skeptical attitude from Nathaniel. He asked the question, well, can anything really good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? You know, you say this man's from Nazareth, and, and yet... You know, nothing that I've seen in my life, Nathan, Nathaniel has to be thinking, comes out of Nazareth. And, and this would be a, a, a legitimate question for them to ask, because Nazareth was not a, a very, uh, 
well thought of city. It, it really was a place that was looked down on. Uh, they were considered less than as people you didn't want to be associated with Nazareth. Uh, and, and so Nathaniel probably rightly asked the question, and maybe a little bit sarcastically asked the question, does anything good from, come from Nazareth? And then Philip again extends the invitation, but he says it this, this way. He says, well, why don't you just come and see for yourself? Why don't you come and see for yourself? Philip is extending the invitation for Nathaniel to stop doing the stereotyping, to stop passing judgment before he actually knows the man, and just come and see first. And so Philip says, come. Why don't you just come and check him out for yourself? Come see for yourself. And at this point, we understand and we see that, that Jesus is, is kind of watching what takes place, it seems like here. He's watching this interaction between Philip and Nathaniel, and there's an interesting act, uh, interaction that takes place now between Jesus and Nathaniel, and we're going to pick up in verse 47 here. So read with me, starting in verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, and he said about him, Here is a true Israelite. No deceit is in him. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus responded to him, Do you believe only because I told you? that I saw you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. And then he said, I assure you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascend and descend on the Son of Man. And there's much backstory that we can get into on this that we really don't have time for this morning. But basically what's going on here is, is Jesus is sharing information about Nathaniel that, that he could not have known about him without knowing him without knowing his history, without knowing his lineage, without knowing what his family was about. And, and Jesus is grabbing Nathaniel's attention here and saying, I know things about you that I cannot possibly know unless I'm the son of God. And so he's grabbing the attention of Nathaniel here, and then he continues to show him who he is. Jesus continues to show Nathaniel who he is. And here's the reality, like this changes Nathaniel's life. This is a turning point for Nathaniel in his life, an invitation was given to two men in just these few short verses. Philip was given an invitation, and he instantly responded. He instantly said, yes, I will follow you. Nathaniel was given an invitation and, and was hesitant. He was skeptical a little bit, but after an interaction with Jesus, accepts the invitation. Let's pause on this for a second and jump forward to Acts chapter 2. A few years pass. All of Jesus' ministry has pretty much happened by this point. Jesus has been crucified. He's, he's risen. He walked out of the grave defeating death. Uh, he spent sev several more days with his followers and then left them to, to spread the word about who he is and start the church. And, and so what we see in, in the beginning chapters of Acts, uh, we, sh we see a, a group of individuals that is really unsure of what they're supposed to do, it seems like. They're... they're not very confident in, in what they're supposed to go out and be about. They're unsure of who they are, they are really as believers. They're unsure of what they're supposed to do without Jesus, like physically with them. And then chapter 2 comes in, and, and, and it tells about God sending the Holy Spirit to this group of believers. And it's called the Day of Pentecost. And, and then Peter goes out, and he gives a message to the city and, and calls for people to repent and follow Jesus. And that leads us up to where we're going to begin here in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. We see a clear picture of the very first church. We see a clear picture of, of what the church is in its most foundational and practical level and how it functions. So read this with me, starting in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. It says this, So those who accepted his message, meaning Peter's message, were baptized in that day 3,000 were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and properly, property and distributed all the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. And every day they devoted themselves to the meeting together in the temple complex, to the breaking of bread from house to house. They ate their food with 
joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all his people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. What we see here is a picture of the first church. What we see here is, is the foundational level of what really the church should be about. Here are some things that are mentioned. So we can just quickly run through them. This is, these are some of the things that the church was committed to in the first century that we should take note on. First, they were committed to teaching, to the apostles' teaching, to the, the teaching of the people that were actually with Jesus, the hearing of the teachings of Jesus. They were committed to teaching. Secondly, they were committed to fellowship, to the koinonia, to the, to the gathering of believers. This was the mutual participation of sharing of goods, sharing of belongings, the reliance on the community of believers in times of need. They were committed to, to the fellowship. They were committed to breaking of bread. And this could mean a couple different things, possibly. It could mean specifically the practice of communion, remembering Christ, what he did for us on the cross. It could also simply mean the communal meals that seemed to be happening regularly in the first century among believers. And there's also some that would would go for, as far as to say that these two are not mutually exclusive and, and that oftentimes when, when believers did gather together, they, they would break bread in the sense that they were having a meal together, but they would also take that opportunity to remember what Jesus did for them. And, and so it was really two things in one. And during meals when there was actually bread present, there's actually wine present, they would, they would take that time and remember Christ's sacrifice. And so... A lot, of, a lot of scholars believe that this was kind of one in the same. But they were committed to the breaking of bread. And then fourth, they were committed to prayer. They were committed to prayer. They were committed to the, the seeking God's leading in their lives, in their, in their church, in the body of believers, gathering together to pray. It was a regular thing that was taking place. It was happening in their homes. It was happening in the community around them. And here's what we see happening in the first century. What we see happening in the first century is we see God showing up in some pretty major ways. We see God showing up and doing some pretty amazing things in the lives of believers and the lives of other people around them. We see God first showing up and doing amazing works and signs through the work of the apostles. It says many wonders and signs were done. God showed up and was doing some pretty amazing things. Secondly, we see the community of believers coming together to support one another. This is an amazing thing when this is actually seen and actually done. It's an amazing thing to see how one another can come together and help in times of need to grow with one another, to have this open-handed mindset where, where what I have is technically mine, but it's yours if you need it. This open-handed mindset this, that where nothing is held for themselves. If something need, it, someone is in need of something I had, it's available. It's pretty amazing to see that God showed up and, and, and used their dedication to each other. They were dedicated to meet together. They were dedicated to be together, to worship together, to, to eat together, to grow together. Dedication to the body is a fantastic thing. And then finally, it's pretty amazing to see how God grew the early church. And he added to their numbers, it says, in the thousands at a time. God showed up and did amazing things. God added to those who were being saved. That is, that is an amazing thing to see. And here's what also we see in the first century. Like if you were a first century believer, you were following Jesus in the first century. If you were a Christian, you were also a part of the church. Like there was no separation between, yeah, I'm a believer, but I'm not really with that group of people. They weird me out. They do some weird things. Like there was none of that. If you were a believer, if you were a follower of Jesus, you are part of the local church. And it seems like more recently, if I can get on a little bit of a tangent, we we, in, in recent years and decades, have kind of pulled away from the idea that believers really need to be a part of the local church. Because more and more you start hearing, right, of people saying, yeah, I can, my church is, you know, in my living room where I can turn on somebody on TV and I can turn on Caleb in the background. And, and that's my church. And nobody makes me upset. And the preacher says all the things that I like, and if he doesn't, then I can turn him off. I know you wish that sometimes. But if you were a part of the church in the first century, you were a part, or you, if you were a believer in the first century, you were a part of the church. That's just how it went. That's how it was supposed to be, and that's how we're supposed to be. And here's what I desire for North Christian Church, and here's what we as a leadership team here desire for North Christian Church. We desire to connect people to Jesus Christ and each other. We desire 
for this to be what we are about. We desire to be about providing a place to connect people with Jesus in real ways. We desire to be a place where people encounter a very real Jesus and experience his love and his grace and his comfort and his joy because he is all those things and he provides all those things. This is what we desire. And we desire, secondly, to be about connecting people to a community of believers. We desire to be about connecting people to a community with each other. We desire to get people in relationships with each other. Life change takes place, I believe, best when we are in community with each other. If I look back on my life, if I look back on where I have seen the most growth take place in my life, it's when I'm, with, when I'm in relationship with other believers. And we're following after Jesus together. And we're learning and we're growing together. Growth takes place in community. Support and encouragement and love and help can be found when we are in relationship with each other. This is what we desire to be as a church. This is what we desire to be as a group of believers. And so let me just over-communicate some things that many of you probably already know, but we want to be really clear this morning. I want to over-communicate some things that we just do here practically in order to be a church that connects people to Jesus Christ and each other. Each week, obviously, we meet at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock in this room to gather to worship, to hear biblical truth, to remember Jesus together. Each week during the 11 o'clock service, kids ages birth through sixth grade have a ministry area that's specific for them where dedicated volunteers, some of you are them, pour into their lives. They point them towards Jesus. They speak into their lives about who God is and who God desires for them to be. Every week, Saturdays at 5 p.m., a group of people gather here together to have Celebrate Recovery. And, and this is a ministry, if you don't know about it, they, they come and they worship and they open the Bible together, but then they walk through things like trauma and, and, and loss and addiction and struggle and pain. And, and any, any struggle that you may be going through, Celebrate Recovery can be there to walk through that with you. And they, and they follow biblical principles while they are doing that. Starting in just a couple weeks, we're going to start up again our care groups. Some of you are a part of care groups already. They're essentially small groups that we have, as well as Bible studies. And, and small groups of people get together on a, me- a weekly basis, and they meet together, and they live life together. They support each other. They live in community with one another. They encourage. They help each other. They pray for each other. They challenge one another, and they follow Jesus together. And groups are not finalized yet. We're still putting together all of the information on that but it's coming out very soon but here's what i want to say that this fall as as a leadership team we want and we're asking if you're a care group leader or you have a care group to consider going through together one set of material with us we're going to be preaching through a, a series that that really is is set out to deepen our relationship with jesus on a foundational level and we're asking care groups to consider going that through that with us and if you're here and you're not a part of a care group and you want to maybe get help in finding a care group, there's out here on the, on the counter in the foyer, there's a c- couple pieces of paper. One of them's for if you just want to get plugged into a care group. Just leave your name on there, leave your email or your phone number, and we'll get in touch with you and we'll help you find a place, find a care group to get plugged into over the next couple weeks. But there's also another piece of paper out there that if you feel like now is kind of the time where God's pushing you to maybe step out and lead a care group, We're always looking for people to lead care groups. And so if that's you this morning, uh, there's a paper out there as well. If you would just leave your name and your contact information, we want to get in touch with you about that. And so care groups are starting up really soon. Stay tuned for information on that, as well as Bible studies. We have strictly just Bible studies that are taking place here on a regular uh, regular time period. Those are starting up here soon. One of them happens at 9, excuse me, at 10 o'clock, the other side of the building, every Sunday after this service as well as throughout the week. Coming soon as well, we're going to be offering small groups for junior high and high school students to build relationships, to follow Jesus together, to have fun together. Every month, some of you know, our senior saints get together for a meal to build community with one another, to follow Jesus together. Every month, a group of people downtown hands out bags of food to those who don't really have much in their lives. We call it Feed a Family. They hand out food, they talk with people, they pray with community members who are in need in that way. And throughout the year as well, we host events such as the block party, but events 
as well to encourage and challenge areas like marriages and families and men and women and kids as we all follow Jesus together. Church, here's what I know. As we step back and as we look at all of this together, here's what I know. We're not there yet. We're not exactly where we want to be. We are not comfortable with where we are at. We are not where we want to be as a church. We're not doing all the things that we want to do. We are not connecting people to Jesus as well as we desire to. We are not connecting people to each other as well as we desire to. But we are not stopping. And we're not just going to sit down and wait for something magical to happen. We are going to continue to work, and we're going to continue to take steps forward. And we're going to continue to move closer and continue following Jesus and what he wants us to do. And so here's where it lands for us this morning. I think each one of us at some level is presented with a decision that, that we need to make. Some of us here, we just need to make the decision to join in what God is doing. Join in the vision, join in the work that God is calling each and every one of us to be a part of. Us. Some of us have been sitting on the sidelines for years, maybe decades. We've been sitting on and watching other people get involved, other people get involved in the mission of God, and we just sit and watch. And this morning, the decision for you might be to step out and get involved. There is so much work to be done. There are so many lives that need to be pointed towards Jesus. There are so many lives that need to be pointed towards other believers. There's so much work that needs to be done in how we connect people to Jesus Christ and each other. And so some of us just need to step out and make that decision this morning. On the counter out here in the foyer as well, next to the sign-up area is a volunteer area as well. Many of you have seen it probably for several weeks. And on that counter, there's just little cards. And on those cards, each card has a ministry area in which we are in need of help in. And there are a bunch. Because the needs are great right now. And so I encourage you, consider praying about getting involved. Stepping out, finding a card, finding a ministry leader, and, and getting involved with the ministry. And if you need help with that, come find me, come find one of the shepherds. We would be honored in order to walk through that process with you. But some of us just need to step out and we need to get involved. For some of us this morning, maybe the decision is that we need to just step out and get connected with other believers. Because some of us have been living in an island, we've been living in our little silo, we've been doing this alone with very little support, and we don't have people really around us. We're not in community with other people. And let me tell you, like I've told you, the greatest growth that I've seen in my life and other people's lives happens when we're in community with one another when we're in relationship with one another, when we're walking through this together. And so if this is you, be praying about that decision. Because information about care groups is coming out in the next couple weeks, and we encourage you to get involved in those. Some of us here, though, need to make a different decision, I think. Because some of us here, though, maybe you have been attending church for, for five minutes or five, 50 years, some of us may need to accept the invitation to simply follow Jesus. And Jesus is standing there and he's saying, follow me. And for years and years, we've turned our back to that. For years and years, we've said, no, no, not right now. But some of us need to make that decision to follow Jesus this morning. The God of the universe. The God of the universe who created each and every one of us, created us with a relationship in mind. He created us to have a relationship with him. But, but things like sin and pride and selfishness and our desire to control our own lives gets in the way of that and it separates us from God. And then 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus that we've talked about, the Son of God, came to earth, and he walked along, among man, he lived a sinless life, and was crucified on a cross, and he carried the weight of our sin on that cross for us. And three days, days later, he defeated death, and he came back to life, and he's now in heaven with God, and he's going to come back for those who follow him. And through all this, we are offered grace. Each and every one of us is offered grace. We are saved by grace by the grace of God that he offers us. Ephesians chapter 2 says it this way. It says, We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under the wrath and the others as well. But God. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. 
So if this is you this morning, and you have never made that decision to follow Jesus, to turn your attention to him in your life, Jesus is calling you, he's asking you, will you follow me? Will you follow me? Will you accept the grace and the salvation from him this morning? And so in just a moment, we're going to continue to sing, and we're going to continue to worship together. And we want to invite you to respond to these decisions that are out there for you. If you're here this morning, and, and you have never made that decision to follow Jesus, but, we, but you want to this morning, you want to talk to somebody about what that looks like, myself and the shepherds will be out in the foyer throughout the end of the service. We would be honored to have that conversation with you. We'd be honored to sit down and study with you about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to make that decision this morning. Or if you're here and you just want somebody to pray with about what's going on in life, we would be honored to do that with you as well. Don't miss another opportunity, church. Don't miss another opportunity to accept the call that Jesus is calling you to. And church, let's together continue to connect people to Jesus Christ and to each other. Father, I'm so thankful. Again, I'm just so thankful for this group of believers, this group of people that gather together here. And I'm thankful for these words from Jesus. I'm thankful for the example we see from the first church, the first century, that at a foundational level, this is what we are called to be about. We're called to point people towards you. We're called to make you great. And we're called to the community of believers that was dedicated to so many things together. And so I pray that as we seek you, as we continue to seek to follow you, I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage and the conviction to step out and to do what you call us to do. And I pray right now, God, as has been prayed already this morning, if there are some here that do not know you, that, ha that have not accepted that, that grace from you, I pray that you would put it on their heart to step out and to speak to somebody this morning to begin a conversation with them. Let everything that we do be about you. Let it be for you. Let it be for your glory. We thank you. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name.